In this week's pre-recorded lecture for Sustainable Settlements, I'm going to be talking about neighbourhood housing and services. This is following on from the transport connectivity session from last week. And what I'm going to cover in this session are some of the ideas of the underpinning theory of um, the compact city. Then I'm going to move on to revisit the 20 minute neighbourhood that we looked at last week, but from a housing and services perspective. And then finally, we're going to look at healthy homes for sustainable settlements. So first of all, we're going to talk about the compact city principle. The compact city is an idea um, that has been around for quite a while now. And it's really an idea that it came about in a challenge to the previous logic for city design, which was, as I mentioned in the post-war era, really based around individual cars and spreading things out over a wide area and developing uh, residential suburbs. So the compact city is all about having um, relatively high densities. And this um, definition from Burton uh, sums it up nicely. A relatively high density mixed use city based on an efficient public transport system and dimensions that encourage walking and cycling. So you'll see from that that there are some familiar terms from last week's session. And the compact city is really one of those ideas that has evolved over time and been taken up by things like the 20 minute neighborhood principle and also things like green cities. So there are a core set of ideas that um, influence and shape the way that we think about designing cities. The features of a compact city, there are lots of different examples you could go and look at to get much more um, detail around different features of a compact city, but essentially density is one of those key principles. So we're talking about quite a lot of things happening on a relatively short, um, sorry, relatively small piece of land. So quite a lot of housing and a mixture of services. Mixed land uses are another really important feature. So as I mentioned previously, the way that we used to design cities, particularly in the post-war era, when we were kind of expecting everyone to drive everywhere, was to have different zones. So you'd have residential zones and particularly um, suburbs. You'd have uh, industrial zones, retail zones, leisure zones. So different land uses happening in different places that people would travel to specifically um, to either go shopping, to go to the cinema, to go to work or to go home. And that idea really now is being challenged and we're actually trying to reverse it. So as we move away from very, very polluting forms of industry, um, we're actually able to start having much more of mixed land uses. And there are real clear benefits to that, which I'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. So we're talking about having housing and commercial things happening on the same, um, the same footprint of land. To make all of this work, as we've mentioned previously, you've got to have a good transport infrastructure. That's not only a pedestrian and cycle uh, infrastructure, but also a good public transport infrastructure. And where appropriate, also space for the car. A compact city, in order to support health and well-being of its population, needs to have really well integrated green and blue spaces. So good integration of green spaces that could be everything from urban woodland through to parks and gardens and street trees and blue spaces is the water infrastructure. So um, sustainable drainage systems and rivers and ponds and lakes. It's important that the compact city is accessible as, and accessible to a diverse range of people. So we're also wanting to move away from the idea of segregation of different populations, areas that are either considered to be really um, affluent or really um, poor. I realise now that, you know, that's that's from a social justice perspective and from a kind of design perspective, that's no longer the way we want to go. We want to have a diversity of people and for cities to be accessible to all of those people. The compact city as an idea has also come under challenge, especially since actual developments have been um, built carrying out these principles. So density is kind of this underlying principle of the, of the compact city. And whilst it's really important to have a certain level of density in order to support a range of services and to make places walkable, if you go too far with density, it can become problematic. So very low densities are problematic and very high density. So we're kind of looking for this optimum sweet spot in terms of density. 
And that is going to change over time as things like um, building design changes and technology around um, transport and smart technologies change. But this idea of density does need to be taken critically. We do need to revisit it because if things, if we have so many things happening in a very small space, then we have problems like noise pollution. We have high land prices because of such competition for small spaces of land. We have very congested spaces, poor air pollution and quite stressful environments for the people living in those places. The National Design Guide is a key text from this week and it has some really good succinct advice and around um, building at density and this idea of, of compact design. So what the design guide says is that density and compact forms are important because they, as we've said, support local public transport and facilities and services. You actually need quite a lot of people to be able to access something like a local shop or a tram service or um, a school or a doctor's surgery. If people have to either walk a very long distance or get some form of public transport to use them, then those services can be quite vulnerable. We also want to try and make these destinations accessible by walking and cycling wherever possible. And again, that does mean having things at quite high density. So this development that you can see in the picture here is actually a medium density development. It's an artist's impression. It's a, an architectural um, design uh, of a medium density development. So you can see that there's you know, about five or six stories of um, residential building here, but surrounding a green space, a public green space with, in this particular example, quite a mature tree at its heart. So this is all about making efficient use of land, having a mixture of uses and really good quality open space that make, makes these places livable. So the 20 minute neighbourhood, as you can see, shares a lot of the common language with this idea of the compact city. It's evolved from that kind of city principle as we've refined some of those ideas over time. Well, last week we looked at the transport mobility elements, um, which can sort of be seen in the, the, the pink section here. So local transport, safe cycling networks, walkability. This week we're kind of looking at the uh, areas in orange and uh, in the kind of blue um, colours at the top there. So we're looking at all the different housing and services elements. These include um, diversity of housing, affordable housing, safe streets, um, good local shops, good local health facilities, local schools, and learning opportunities, local employment opportunities, and all of these things, again, to be well connected. The 20 minute neighbourhood principle also talk, talks about um, density. So you can see here from the um, TCPA guide on the 20 minute neighbourhood, this really handy diagram that shows the difference between high, low and medium density. So we are really looking at working around that medium density idea that you can see um, the image at the bottom of the diagram here. Medium density kind of gets away from this very high stressful environment of a very high rise, but it supports a good range of services and facilities. When you are thinking about your neighbourhood design, think about the different types of housing needs that a diverse population might need. And what might this look like? So obviously not, we don't want just one type of um, one size family or one type of person to be living in the area, which means we're going to need a variety of different housing types. How can you bring together this idea of variety of housing with this design principle of medium density? I mentioned before that mixed land uses are a really important feature of this compact um, city design, compact neighbourhood design. The reason that we want to look at mixed land uses is not only to minimise um, use of the car, but it's also because when you have a mixture of land uses, the same area uh, is well used at lots of different times of the day, which makes it feel much safer, more accessible. So when we tend to zone these areas, you would have, say, a, um, a shopping area that was completely empty at night. You'd have residential areas that were completely empty during the day. And you'd have a kind of leisure um, areas like cinemas and uh, entertainment areas like that, that were really busy between maybe the hours of you know, five and ten. The rest of the time, they were pretty empty. 
So if you can integrate a mix of uses, then these areas will actually remain quite busy at different times of the day. And this is a nice image here where you can see some, some very historical features there of the local church. Um, on the ground floor there, you've got shops and restaurants, and above that, you've got medium density housing. And so you can imagine that people would be using this area for lots of different things at lots of different times of the day. Another feature of mixed land uses is this idea of an integrated mix of housing types and tenures. So I can talk to you a bit more if you've not heard the term housing tenure before, but essentially it means the difference between owning and renting. Um, so you can uh, have owner occupiers, you can have people that rent from social landlords uh, like housing associations and local councils. You can have people renting from private landlords. And it's important to think about also different type stages of life and the different types of housing that you would need at those different stages of life. And what we're looking at really as a design principle moving forward is to integrate all of those different types of housing. So we don't want um, it to be really clear where the rental properties are and where the owner occupier properties are. This is what's meant by tenure neutral and socially inclusive. So rather than have areas that are very clearly the um, social rented housing that's obviously of a lower quality than the privately owned housing. We really want to provide good quality housing for a whole range of different income groups and a whole range of different ages. So what this could look like in practice is the idea of mixed land uses and this is another diagram from the TCPA um, 20 minute neighbourhood and there's that magic 800 metres distance. So this diagram has um, uses all those different colours from the different features of the 20 minute neighbourhood and kind of arranges them uh, in this diagram to show you how they might be integrated and mixed. So what you've got to be thinking about here is, you know, how can you have lots of different compatible land uses happening on the same in the same sort of space? So you can mix residential and commercial, like we saw in the last diagram, oh sorry, the last photograph. You could have shops and schools close together. You could have medical and sport facilities close together. You could have parks with cafes in them, which is already quite a, a classic arrangement, but different land uses that would actually get different groups of people into the same area um, for different reasons at different times. So when we're talking about Home, healthy homes here. We're again using that really broad definition of health that we've been uh, that we were talking about last week. So healthy homes are not only healthy in terms of the physical health of the individuals, but they're also healthy in terms of the mental health and mental well-being. And that's one of the reasons that we want to really take seriously this idea of reversing social social segregation of housing. It has been um, a kind of unquestioned logic that, of course, you would have, you know, rich areas and poor areas. You'd have areas of privately owned properties and you'd have areas of social housing. But we can really question whether that is actually necessary. Um, surely we the ideal moving forward is that you have good quality housing uh, for everybody that's accessible and affordable for everybody. And that you create healthier communities if in fact you do have a really good range and mixture of, of people in that area and if you think as well about trying to keep jobs local you're going to have people working in an area in quite different types of professions and jobs so you may have people working in a local school and you want all those people to maybe be able to live relatively locally so you'd have people who are earning relatively high salaries and maybe school management all the way down to people who are working in the kitchen who would be on a lower salary and is there any reason why all those people couldn't live in the local area and again you could apply that to uh, a hospital model where you would have people on very different incomes all working for the same hospital but yeah, ideally you would want those people all to be able to live within a relatively local area so we don't really want to have these ideas of ghettos and segregation of housing moving forward in order to also have healthy homes, you need to have good quality external and internal space. So there are lots of different ways you can, you can look at this in a lot more detail. Again, there's really good design guides for healthy housing, but good levels of light, good levels of ventilation um, to be able to keep homes uh, warm enough and cool enough to have good quality green spaces that are visible from the housing and accessible from the housing. I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but here is a summary of the, the Town and Country Planning Association's Healthy Homes 
um, principles you can have a little look at. But this is really important, sort of holistic. It takes into consideration things like changing climate and being adaptable and resilient to changing climates, all the way through things like fire risk, um, to be situated in places that feel safe and accessible, um, to be free from kind of unacceptable noise pollution, all those kinds of things. It's also important to remember that when we talk about healthy, we're talking about health of the you know, wider global systems as well. So we're trying to build homes that actually support environmental sustainability so that we can build homes at a high level of environmental um, sustainability. Those technologies exist and those uh, would embrace sort of different kinds of construction methods, but also different kinds of materials to minimise the use of resources and energy in the building and the construction of, of housing. You also want to have good levels of internal and external air quality. Um, that again is to do with ventilation, to do with the materials that are used in the construction of the home and to do with the, the quality of the environment surrounding the home in terms of air quality. And we also want to think about how we can integrate sustainable design features like heat pumps, low energy lighting, smart design features to help manage the home efficiently, water recycling, energy generation, that kind of thing. So when you're thinking about your neighbourhood design and understanding some of the things that you might be looking for in terms of an optimum neighbourhood, you need to think about who's going to live there, um, what kind of services and facilities might those, those people need, what types of housing might they need, and how can you start to take some of these best practice guides, like the ones that I've referenced this week, and use some of those principles to think about how you're actually going to design your neighbourhood. And think about how those elements would work spatially. So we thought last week a lot about the 800 metres and the arrangement of, of space. So now you're thinking about what you're actually going to put in that area in terms of housing and services, as well as how it's going to be arranged. Here are the three main press practice guides that I've referred to this week. Um, two Town Country Planning Authority guides and the UK Government National Design Guide. Thanks very much and I'll see you in class.